G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. Today we're going to take a little look, uh, a very early look in fact, at the 2024 AFL Draft. Now we're in the wake of the 2023 Draft. Like I said the other day, everyone's still basking in you know, the presents that were unwrapped on uh, Draft Day, so to speak, and uh, embracing all the highlights packages and getting excited for next year. But I thought I would take a very early look at next year just to see what is coming up 12 months from now. Um, there's going to be a lot of father-sons. It's an unprecedented amount of father-sons, I reckon, uh, which we will cover in this video. I'll give you a vague profile of the top five, a general observations about the draft, as well as a look at some academy prospects as well. If you could do me a favor before we get into the rest of the video, if you don't mind subscribing to the channel, it will help me out. I'm trying to get to 25K by the end of the year, and uh, that will be a very, very nice goal to hit. Great, so now, in terms of a general description of the 2025 draft, there's a few characteristics that are worth noting. Uh, first of all, it is quite a midfield heavy draft in contrast to 2023. In 2023, um, you know, there was a lot of a lot of running backs, that was the uh, running defenders, I should say. That's an NFL term. I was watching the movie Draft Day, forgive me. A lot of rebounding defenders in this year's draft, uh, a lack of pure midfielders, quite a few key position players. In particular, in the second round and beyond, obviously we saw like three or four go in the first round, Tall's uh, in Caddy, Croft, Walter and Ethan Reed, or of course Connor Roy Sullivan, potentially Dan Curtin. Actually, now I think about that, is quite a lot of talls. And uh, by contrast, this this year's coming draft, 2024, is a lot more midfield heavy. There was a distinct lack of midfielders in uh, 2023's draft. There was McKercher and Sanders in the top 10. Um, you know, Harley Reid was kind of more of a utility than a pure midfielder. By contrast, we've got some genuine on ballers particularly populating the top end of next year's draft. Like I said, it is going to be a compromised draft as well. So if you're frustrated by 2023, 2024 is going to have its own uh, little academy mix. Or well, in particular, it's actually more of a father-son uh, rule kind of compromising it rather than academies as such. But we'll get into more detail too. Rule changes in this space will be interesting because obviously there's going to be well, it's not clear that there's going to be a review of the system, but I'd imagine with uh, as much talk as there is at the moment and clubs feeling frustration, Next Generation Academy rules could change next year, allowing clubs to potentially match bids on their NGA players in the top 30 or the top 20, who knows. So to start, I will give you guys a bit of a profile on probably the top five prospects, as they're the ones I'm somewhat familiar with. Um, I'm not going to go through the entire you know draft pool because um, you know so much can change between then and now, and it's, uh, it's a little bit pointless. But generally, we've got a feel for who the probable top five is going to be. Uh, but of course, you know some of these could slide. And crazier things have happened than these guys you know potentially going undrafted. So who knows? But we'll take you through the top five. First of all, let's talk about Finn O'Sullivan. He is a currently 182 centimeter inside mid. The interesting thing about him as well is that he is Sam Walsh's cousin. And uh, by comparison as well, he kind of plays similarly to Sam Walsh in being a sort of balanced inside out midfielder, very silky. He's described as tough, consistent, and good overhead. And at 182 centimeters, you think being 17, there's a good chance he hits those high 180s numbers. So a lot of growth to come from a lot of these draftees. But Finn O'Sullivan, from what I can gather, is probably considered the best prospect this far out, but it is quite even. Another player is Jagger Smith, another midfielder from Vic Metro, 181 centimeters. So at the moment, that seems like it's on the small side, but that could easily become 185, 186. Again, he's kind of considered a bit of a Josh Kelly type as well in that he is a ball magnet and he's an extremely evasive player as well. So again, he's a he's a pick one contender, but you know, we're just kind of talking about the top five generally as it's quite even. The third prospect I'll mention is Sid Draper, the younger brother of Collingwood's Arlo Draper, who was considered a first round talent for much of 2021 and ended up sliding to pick 45. But nonetheless, Sid looks like a much more accomplished player at the same age. He's 180 centimeters at the moment and is a midfielder forward from South Australia. He was actually South Australia's MVP at the carnival and he was the All-Australian in the under 18s uh, championships on a half forward flank as well. I've heard through the big footy grapevine, the Crows are a really big fan of him. So whether they try and trade up to get a pick in the first handful of picks ahead of their father-son selection in Tyler Welsh, who I'll talk about later, that will be an interesting one to watch. But Sid Draper looks to be an absolute gun. Then there's Josh Smilly. He is a huge midfielder. He is also from Vic Metro. He's 194 centimeters and 92 kilos. And bear in mind, that's tall if he was drafted today and heavy. But let alone in 12 months' time, this kid could literally grow to being 200 centimeters. And uh, it remains to be seen whether he becomes a two-meter midfielder 
those things, that doesn't seem so far away uh, in terms of where our game is heading at the moment. But as you can imagine, a very tall and contested midfielder. So it'll be interesting to see if he de- develops a second position because at 92 kilos already, it's not as though he's on the skinny and raw side either. Then there is Levi Ashcroft, another father son for the Brisbane Lions. And uh, surprise, surprise, it is Will's brother for anyone who was unaware. He's also from Vic Metro. He's 179 centimeters and uh, kind of stylistically not dissimilar to Will. Pretty good inside outside balance doesn't probably project as being as quite good as Will, but we're still talking about him as a top five prospect and he's still got his whole top age year to go. So when you consider how many players I just mentioned there for Vic Metro in their midfield, you can probably get a glimpse of how next year's under 18 championships is going to go. But there is a lot of development to play out and I wouldn't be surprised if the top five looks completely different in 12 months. So that's the top five prospects and I'll give you a few father-son prospects that I'm aware of. There could be more, but I've kind of skimmed off the top here, but I've got a six for you, which is quite interesting. So I did just mention one, Levi Ashcroft, potentially rated as a top five player in next year's draft. There's also Tyler Welsh, son of Scott Welsh, who played for three clubs, but most uh, most of his games were at the Adelaide Crows, so they will have rights to him. He's considered about a first-round prospect, somewhere in that first round, potentially top 10. It's a long way to go. Uh, but he's a 191-centimeter key forward, which, again, you'd imagine he gets that 195, 196 mark. Then there's the Camperioli Twins. Ben and Lucas, and they're both quite similar players from what I can gather. One's 184 centimeters, one's 183, and they're both wing types. Ben, uh, as far as I can tell, is expected probably in the top dozen on current rankings, and then Lucas is also considered a first round prospect as well. So Carlton are gonna have their work cut out, trying to match two bids in the first round, but we'll see how that plays out. Later in the draft, Port Adelaide have two father sons of their own. They've got Louis Montgomery, son of uh, Brett Montgomery, He's considered more of a mid-draft prospect and he's 183 centimeters as a forward. So it'll be interesting to see where exactly he goes. And then there's Rome Burgoyne, who is a late draft prospect, but he is an 181 centimeter defender. So as you can see, I've just listed four father sons that are likely to go in the first round of next year. Like I said, I'm gonna keep saying it, Lot to play out yet, but they are all strong prospects at this current point of time. Now let's talk about some top rated academy players. I've just found some that uh, we know of yet that they currently have a profile, but there's a lot of things to play out, of course. But there's Christian Moraes, and I'm not 100% sure if he's a Hawthorne NGA, but I have found it written somewhere on Bigfooty unofficially that he might be a next generation academy talent for the Hawthorne Football Club. It is likely to be irrelevant because Moraes is a midfielder who's likely to go in the top 10 of the draft. And you wouldn't imagine the NGA rule snap back to what they used to be and Hawthorne could match a bid there. So he's likely to go open pool, but technically an NGA player, I think. Then there's Leonardo Lombard. He's a Gold Coast Academy player and he's a midfielder forward who's likely to go probably in the top 10 as it currently stands, if it was drafted today, which, you know, it's not. Then there's the Brisbane Lions Academy player in Sam Marshall. He is a midfielder defender, and again, also expected to go roughly in the first round, according to some. Joel Cochran, a key defender from the Sydney Swans Academy. Uh, he's about 194 centimeters or something like that. I'm actually not too sure at the height, but at this stage, projected to go into the second round, most likely. Jaden Nguyen, uh, forgive me if there's any Vietnamese viewers, I've butchered the pronunciation Nguyen. I used to have a teacher who was called um, Nguyen, and he made us pronounce it that way because the real pronunciation is quite difficult. But that's how I say it, and I'm sorry. But he's a wingman, about 175 centimeters currently, but again, second or third round prospect at this stage. And then Brisbane have another player in Tom Gillett, who's probably gonna go later in the draft as a ruck forward. So on the surface, Gold Coast might score another first round pick in Lombard, and as may Brisbane through Sam Marshall, as well as a father-son. So there's gonna be a compromise nature there. Uh, as for the Sydney Swans, GWS, Other than Cochran, who goes to the Swans most likely through their academy, uh, it's not too compromised in terms of the Northern academies. It's really the father-sons that are fleshing out this draft. So to round out this video, we'll take a quick look at the current draft order for 2024, because if you're a casual fan and may have forgotten, uh, obviously the 2024 draft order, while it's not set yet, you can tell some teams have first rounders and some don't because of uh, trades that were done both live and in this year's trade period. So we'll have a look at it here. A few takeaways that come straight to the eye. The Fremantle currently hold three first round picks. As you'd know, if you'd follow the trade period, they accumulated these three picks 
And it's unclear exactly what they're going to do with him. They either re- really rate this draft or it's draft collateral to get uh, someone in for a trade. Sydney have both their own first rounder and North Melbourne's priority pick next year. That will be at the end of first round, so it's not tied to North's position. Gold Coast have two first rounders. They have the Western Bulldogs first rounder, their own first rounder, as well as North Melbourne's priority pick on top of their own second rounder again next year. So they hold a really strong draft hand and are well poised to potentially even get a pick in before a bid comes for Lombard. There's three teams that don't hold first rounders next year. You've got Collingwood, who traded it to Fremantle for Schultz, and then they got a second rounder from Hawthorne for Ginevan, but they don't technically hold a first rounder. Neither do Port Adelaide, and neither do the Western Bulldogs, who traded it to the Gold Coast Suns. Other observations is Richmond has accumulated a whole stack of later picks that they can potentially use to trade up with clubs looking for points for their father sons or academies. And Carlton's first rounder in particular could be on offer here. Well, almost certainly will be if they're going to try and match two father sons in the first round. Uh, So potentially we see Richmond trading a whole stack of picks and getting an extra first rounder next year. That's the way I sort of see Richmond's strategy going next year. So there you have it, guys. That is a pretty short and sharp profile of next year's draft. Obviously, it's going a little bit compromised, uh, but mostly due to the father-son rule. Uh, But there's a lot to play out, so things could look very, very different. Naturally, unlike 2023, there isn't a clear number one prospect like there was with Harley Reid. So we could see more trades done at the top end if the talent pool is considered particularly even. But, you know, top picks won't necessarily get traded for as much as they would have this year because clubs are likely to see the talent pool similarly, if that makes sense. But anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed this little profile I've made for you. Let me know in the comments section uh, what you think below and uh, if there's anyone I missed that you think is worth mentioning. There's a whole heap of like top 10 prospects that people do know about already in advance uh, because they would have played in their underage year. But uh, by all means, give them a shout out in the comments section below. But thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.